I've had some time to review the Unearthed Arcana 2022 Character Origins content that was recently released for the one D&D playtest. As the name suggests, it focuses on your character's ancestry and early days before actually becoming an adventurer, which is great, but how does it compare to the 5th edition rules as they are now? Let's take a look. Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we love geeky wisdom. If you're new to the channel, my name is Brian, and we release new videos weekly, so please consider subscribing and turning on the notifications so you don't miss out on any of the content. In comparing the existing D&D materials with the new 1D&D Character Origins playtest material, it's important to remember a few key things. First, Wizards of the Coast makes it very clear that the PDF they released is draft. It's not the final content that will appear in the player's handbook. Those of us that were a part of the D&D Next playtest know that's kind of how it works. In fact, that's the whole point. They want us to use it and provide feedback and let them know what works for us and what doesn't so that they can refine it for the final version of the game. Second, they also point out that these character options may be either less powerful or more powerful than what is currently published in the existing materials in 5e. And they say if a design survives the playtest, then they will adjust it to the power level that they want before it's officially released, whatever that might mean. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Take it with a grain of salt. And third, this is only the character origins material. So they'll be releasing other content related to other things like classes and spells and all of that kind of stuff in batches. So that means it may refer to things that haven't been released yet, and they may show up later in other Unearthed Arcana playtest materials. And finally, as I go through this material, I'm going to try and compare it to what is established already in the published 5e game system in either the player's handbook or some of the other existing materials. This is important because it is not going to be a one-to-one -one comparison of this playtest with the 2014 Player's Handbook. That's a key distinction. Some of the topics and other changes in 5e didn't exist in that book and were released in a different book, like in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything or Monsters of the Multiverse or any of the other supplements, and those informed some of this playtest material. One thing that strikes me right off the bat as different is that this playtest material focuses only on the character origins information, which is a good thing because they want to test out one piece at a time so that we can kind of get the full effect of that specific set of rules. That means that this material covers the character race, background, starting languages, and feats. That's right, all new characters get a feat at first level. And that's right, feats have levels. They explain this in the determining your character origin section. After choosing your character's class, it's time to consider the character's origin. Who are the character's ancestors? How did the character spend those years leading up to a life of adventure? To help answer those questions, you choose three things for your character. A race, background, and a language. Notice that it says after choosing a class. I'm not sure if I like that you choose the class first, to be honest. If you watched my character prologue video, you'll know that I like to select the character's class after their race and background and other things that I include there. But I'll reserve some judgment until I learn a little bit more about the playtest material for classes and some of the other things they're going to release. In the 2014 Player's Handbook, you had a choice of playing a dwarf, elf, halfling, human, dragonborn, gnome, half-elf, half-orc, or tiefling. In this playtest, the half-elf and the half-orc races are removed, but they provide rules for creating a custom race using any two different humanoid kinds. So you can still play a half-elf. The rules basically say you choose the race options for one parent and then mix and match the visuals for that race however you'd like. Then you just take the average of the two lifespans of the races. I really like this change, by the way. It provides a lot of flexibility and you can really go crazy with your imagination here. Added to the list, though, is orc. So you can play an orc or you can still play a half-orc using those rules that we just talked about. And a new race called the Ardlings. And Ardlings are either born on the upper plains or have ancestors who originated there. It's sort of similar to the Asamir in that way. But they have a head resembling an animal. 
and may even have fur or feathers depending on the animal that you choose. And you can actually choose the animal, so it doesn't limit you to a set of animal types, but they have a few examples that are there so that you can kind of guide yourself down that thought process. They're classified further into three subgroups depending on which of the upper planes they hail from. And something that may be controversial is the angelic flight ability. As a bonus action, they sprout spectral wings, not real wings, but spectral wings. And this lasts only for a moment and you can move up to your movement speed and you can use it a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. I think it's actually pretty tame for a beginning character, but other DMs may disagree and that's okay. They can use it or not at their table. Just remember, this is a play test, so test it out. And besides Ardling, the new one, I think that the races are pretty similar to what's currently in the game. There are a few minor adjustments to their sort of sub-race classifications or some of their special abilities, but to me at least, it's not too crazy of a change. The biggest difference between this set of rules and the 2014 Player's Handbook is that the races don't include any ability modifiers. None. And that's because they're now tied to backgrounds. When the concept of backgrounds was introduced back in the D&D Next playtest and then published in the Starter Set and 5th Edition Player's Handbook, I can remember really liking this concept. But while all that stuff was coming out, I was talking to my longtime best friend and D&D compatriot, Carrie, and he brought up a really good point. They sort of listed some basic backgrounds there, check, and they gave some personality traits, also kind of cool, but then they said, oh yeah, you can mix and match and make a background of your own. It felt like defined name backgrounds were the ones that you had to go with. Not really had to go with, but it felt like they were telling you that this is how you should play the character. I know that they didn't mean it to be that way, it just felt that way. The ability to make up your own was discussed there, like I said, but it was almost like an afterthought. Use these backgrounds and if you want to, you can make one of your own. So I'm happy to say they fixed that in this material. In fact, Jeremy Crawford brought up the same point that Carrie did almost 10 years ago. He said they changed it to be custom background focused, basically. The section in the PDF is actually called Build Your Background, which seems like a way better way to frame it. So to build a background, come up with your own basic idea of what a background theme should be. Then determine your ability score modifiers. You can either give a plus two bonus to one ability and a plus one bonus to another, or you can spread it out and do plus one bonuses to three different abilities. Then you choose two skills and one tool for your character to be proficient in. You also get a language proficiency of your choice. This may sound familiar to those of you that have Tasha's Cauldron of Everything because it's very similar to the whole custom lineage concept. So, like I said, hard to compare to the player's handbook, but this isn't new to the game. 5th edition has had something similar to this already. The difference is it was tied to racial abilities back then, and this is just adjusting it over to the background. The background also grants you a choice of that first level feat that I talked about. That's it. Those are the ways of building a background. Those are the mechanics. You create your own story or theme and then use these mechanics to build the background. It really does a good job of laying it out for you. Granted, you could be doing this now, but the process is much easier to follow in this version. So I'm an upvote for this. After they explain how to build your background, then they give you a list of sample backgrounds. And you can choose one if you don't wanna come up with one over your own from the ground up it's actually easier to understand how they were constructed because they just showed you how to build one. So you can kind of look at the existing ones that are there and see how they put it together. One thing that is missing from this section though are all of those personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. Now it could be that they're gonna be adding these to a different section, I don't know, haven't seen that material yet, but I don't see it mentioned anywhere in this playtest material. If you notice something, please comment below and let me know. I really hope they don't get rid of these. I know we can all create these on our own and experienced role players can kind of just do these on the fly, but I do think that it helped a lot of people think about their character creation in a different way, and I think it helped new players get into the whole idea of role playing. Next up are the first level feats, which imply that they will have other levels. And just side note, you know, with this being D&D and everybody ordering pizza whenever they play, or a lot of us ordering pizza whenever they play, do you think they should create a pizza feat? Like a pizza? There isn't a hungry soul in this town doesn't know my slogan. 
Just direct to your pizza to Daddy Green's Pizza. Watch yourself, son. Some feats may be repeatable, but none of the first level feats require a prerequisite feat that you have to take first, which makes sense. You only get one. But I'm assuming because they talk about prerequisites that that means in other levels of feats may have prerequisites, sort of like that whole feat tree type of concept where you take one and then you build to another and so on. I'm not going to go through all of the feats, but I will say that I like a change to the healer feat. It both lets someone be a battle medic to use a healer's kit to actually heal, not just stabilize someone, and it makes healing more potent for those healing spells. I also like the crafter feat because it not only gives you a tool proficiency, but it also gives you 20% discount when you buy non-magical things. That's kind of cool because you're already a maker and you can decide whether something is made well, you can kind of haggle, I guess, or get a discount. It also reduces the time it takes to craft an item by 20%, which could be handy if you have crafters in your game. Let me know in the comments below if you have other current feats that you're really hoping stay in the game or ones that you want them to get rid of. While there were some changes that may be controversial to some in the races and backgrounds in the feat section, I think yeah, I'm pretty sure that it may be the updated rules glossary that gets the most attention. First, they changed the term of rolling a d20 to do something a d20 test, which now covers everything that you need to do to roll a d20, and I actually like it. So that means an ability check, an attack roll, and a saving throw, you're doing a d20 test, which simplifies things, it streamlines it. I like the approach. If you think about new players, it's much easier to remember that some things require a d20 test. And a d20 test is simply a d20 that you roll and add something. I know it's always been that way, but simplifying it in the rules and making it easier to explain is good for the game. Also, maybe controversial to some, but rolling a 1 on any d20 test is always a failure and rolling a 20 always a success. So I think most people are already doing this in combat, but I can understand why people may not like this when it comes to ability checks. There's a good argument that people can make by saying an unskilled person, someone that doesn't even have proficiency in a skill, shouldn't have a 5% chance to, I don't know, pick a masterwork lock or decipher a code or kick down a heavy door if they don't have, you know, a good athletic skill. But I would agree with that to some level, but the way I've always house ruled those attempts is that you can only make those type of checks if you have proficiency in the skill. With the exception of strength, usually you can do that even if you're just really strong. And if people really wanted to, even if they weren't proficient in the skill, I wouldn't hold them back. I'm a DM that's open-minded. So I would just say, all right, but since you're not proficient in whatever that is, you roll it with disadvantage, but we should play test it and see how it goes. Another thing that I don't think will last actually is the change to critical hits. Only weapons and unarmed strikes made by player characters can be crits. No spell attacks, which, you know, not a big deal. And did you catch that by the way? Let's play it again. Only weapons and unarmed strikes made by player characters can be crits. Yeah, that means the DM doesn't crit. Not sure how I feel about that, but again, it's a play test. Let's see how it goes and then give feedback. Nobody's making you do these rules. You're just play testing and seeing how they work out. In addition to some of the information about rests and conditions, they also provide a new set of spell lists. Now, this doesn't really mean they're replacing the class spell lists. We'll have to wait until they release the classes or the spell play test to figure out what they're going to do in general with spells and spell casting. These new lists just classify existing cantrips and first level spells into categories, arcane, divine, and primal, and I really like this. These lists are mainly used with the magic initiate, but I suspect they'll come into play with other material as well. Personally, I think this is better anyway, and they should just do this with all their spells, but hey, let's see how it turns out. Well, that's my rundown of the one D&D character origins playtest material. I want to take a moment to reiterate, if you don't want to do this one D&D stuff, then just keep on doing whatever it is you're playing. There are plenty of people who were happy with the previous editions and they still play those exact editions. Some of them are still playing first edition or advanced D&D or basic or second or third or 3.5 or whatever. Nobody is taking your books away. Play the way you like. 
Okay, I've been rereading the Dresden Files again, and this little gem of geek philosophy popped into my mind earlier today. So let me close with a few words from Jim Butcher. There aren't any magical words, really. Words just hold the magic. Cheers. <laughs>